Welcome to the In His Grip podcast with Dr. Chuck F. Betters, produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary as he preaches the series, Building a Spiritual Legacy. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. This is the second strophe, second verse that we're going to focus on this morning. As you know, I am trying to develop a theme through this series, and I hope you're getting it by now, that uh, I am responsible as a father, and my wife is responsible as a mother, to pass on to our children and to our grandchildren a legacy of the gospel, so that in the years to come, our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren for generations to come will be called by his name and will love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm using the Psalms, which are the actual hymn book of the Old Testament, to build a principial foundation for how we can develop that legacy. We're going to take a look not at all of the Psalms, but at select Psalms, spend a couple of weeks on each of them so that we can not just look at the psalm, but look at its ramifications. For now, we're looking at Psalm 84, which, of course, is one of the great, great psalms of the Bible that speak of David when he was alienated and separated from the church. David was in hiding from Absalom, and as the result of that, found himself away from Jerusalem away from the house of God, and he craved with all of his heart that God would bring him back into that kind of intimacy again. This is not to say that David did not worship God when he was alone. David certainly did, but there was something very special, some void in his life because he was not with God's people. He wanted to take full advantage of every opportunity to be with God's people while they worshiped, so that he might uh, see the iron sharpening the iron so that his intimacy with his God would be increased as the result of that. All around you this morning, there are people who have come here with different needs. But we have all come with one purpose, I hope, and that is to develop a greater intimacy with our God, to engage him as he engages us. In other words, to walk out of here different people than when we came in. You know, the Bible tells us that if we will not praise him, even the rocks will cry out. Sharon and I spent the last uh, 10, 15 days or so uh, on a uh, little respite. We went to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, kind of the Bible belt, and uh, had a wonderful opportunity down there to go to a place that uh, put on a show, like Radio City Music Hall does and what have you. And uh, we figured it would be nice and clean. We were actually working ourselves up for like a hoot nanny, And uh, because, you know, you're in the South, you're going to hear all these uh, these, uh, banjos and everything else playing. But when we went to the Carolina Opry, it was different. It was the first night of their Christmas program. And as we were watching this program unfold, it included humor and secular songs. You heard the jingle bells. You heard the Santa Claus is coming to town and all those other things that really do not speak of the message of the gospel, the message of Christmas. But uh, sprinkled throughout and threaded throughout the performance, about halfway through, I said to Sharon, I leaned over to her and I said, I wonder if these people realize how articulately they are presenting the gospel. Because the songs were powerful. Many of them were songs that uh, were taken from uh, black gospel. Uh, Some were taken from southern gospel. Some were from traditional music. But they were all speaking and building upon the message. And I couldn't help but think that I wonder how many of those folks standing up on that stage, very skilled performers, by the way. uh, It was just an absolute brilliant performance and it was the highlight of our trip. I wondered how many of them actually knew what they were doing, what they were saying. That here we are, we're standing there, and I I said, I leaned over to Sharon, I said, you know, even the rocks will cry out. And 
5,000 people or so were in that beautiful facility, and we were just mesmerized, I was, by what was taking place as the message of the gospel was becoming clearer and clearer. I began to realize that there had to be a Christian influence behind this program. Although it was not distinctively Christian, somebody knew what they were doing. When it came to the very end, the lady up on stage who started out by herself with one of the most talented voices I've ever heard. I mean, this is just absolutely brilliant. And we read in the program that she had uh, been featured on different Christian programs, and so I knew there had to be a Christian influence there. And that program ended with her singing, He's Alive. And I've never seen it or heard it sung that way. With all of the technology and all of the dancers and all of the lighting and all of the thunder and lightning and just an incredible, absolutely incredible performance of that great, great song. And about three quarters of the way through, a man stood up in the center of the audience and just raised his hands. And before you knew it, 5,000 people were up on their feet feet doing the very same thing. It was just an incredible illustration of even the rocks will cry out. And I thought to myself, this is the church. Where God's people are, that's where the church is. It's not a building. David wasn't craving a building. He was craving being with God's people. And we knew we were with some of God's people. Certainly not all the performers were believers, but even they had to sing of our Redeemer's great love. And it was just a mesmerizing experience for us to see that the church is everywhere. So David wasn't longing for the building. In fact, the building to which David was desiring to go was what I would call a shack. The temple had not yet been built. Solomon in all of his glory had not yet built that wonderful temple what David was craving was fellowship with God's people, intimacy with his God in a shack. He said, I would love to be one of those birds in the ceiling, one of those caged birds up there in the ceiling. He remembered as he was worshiping there, now being alienated from the temple, he remembered seeing those birds, antiphonally singing and responding to the people who were worshiping God. There is no such thing as an isolated form of worship that will benefit you to the degree that worship with God's people does. We are to worship corporately. We are also to worship privately. And those two comprise for us the kind of spiritual growth that we need. Kind of troubles me on a Sunday morning, sometimes on a Wednesday night, when I come to the church just prior to Sunday school or just prior to the Wednesday evening program, to see the line of cars leaving the church, parents who drop their children off, even though the Bible is being taught, even though women can gather with other women, men can gather with other men. On a Sunday morning, classes are being held. Sunday school teachers who take time to prepare God's word are doing just that. They thought it was more important to go out and buy a breakfast or go do some shopping, and we become the grand babysitting service. Do you know what a message you're sending to your children when you do that? Do you know what kind of legacy you're building when that's just not important to you? I periodically keep in touch with a man who uh, had to leave this church years ago uh, because he moved to another part of the country. It was a very heart-rending decision for him. One of the great things that uh, he considered was his church, and leaving his church family. Periodically, he'll give me a call, or I'll give him a call. He's in, well up into his 70s. And every time I talk to him, he says the same thing. I can't believe how much time while I was there at Glasgow I wasted. I cannot believe how many times I sat out in the narthex, or I roamed the halls, or I left to go and get breakfast, when the word of God was being taught and I didn't think it was important enough. He said, somehow or another, God got a hold of my heart and if I could come back to that church and stand in the pulpit, I would tell you, please understand that God's word is pure. 
And God's word needs to be learned. And God's word needs to be experienced. He's now taking apologetics and polemics and studying biblical theology at the age of 79 or 80, whatever he is now. And he said, please tell the people to take advantage. Please tell them to take advantage of every opportunity they have to study God's word. You know, when it comes to defining a church, a church is a body that comes together for several reasons. We come together to worship. That's similar to what we're doing right now. We come to worship God. We come to worship God with each other with different needs. We come to hear the word of God preached. We come to experience the sacraments. We come to celebrate even discipline, where we learn to discipline one another and educate and teach one another. But at the core of what we do, at the core of the, the worship of the body is the preaching of God's word. Preaching is so fundamental to what we do as believers. That's what the prophets were for in the Old Testament. That's what the apostles were doing in the New Testament. The preaching of God's word. The logos. The preaching of the word of God. The preaching of the word is going to disturb. But the preaching of the word is also going to give us hope. There is no greater illustration of this than Psalm 84. We dealt with the first verse. These verses, by the way, in Psalm 84 are set into chapters or verses, if you will, strophes of a hymn. And they're separated by the word selah, which simply means stand back a moment, rest, take this in, absorb this. And then he goes on to the second verse. He says in the first verse, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, o Lord God Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home. Look at verse 2 again. He uses three words to describe how he's going to worship. He's going to worship with his soul. He's going to worship with his heart. He's going to worship with his flesh. Mind and soul and body are all given to God. And his alienation from the temple... His separation from God, this lack of intimacy that he desired, caused his body to hurt. It caused his mind to hurt. His heart and his flesh cried out to God that he would have that intimacy again. He posits even the possibility that he would be a bird in the ceiling than to be where he was. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. You'll notice he calls him Lord Almighty, the holy other God, the fully transcendent God, the one who cannot be touched because he is God, the Lord God Almighty, the holy other God. But then he speaks of him as my Lord, my God. He says, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. This holy other transcendent God is also an imminent God, a God who can be touched, a God who can be experienced, a God who even though he is creator of the universe and creator of us is the same God that condescends to be a man, who condescends to our level so that he might experience what you and I experience and die in order that we might have life. He says in verse 4, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they are ever praising you. Well, now the man is alienated. We're ready for the second verse of the hymn. If you look at the second verse of the hymn, you see the essence of the principle. The principle is that we must teach our children love for the church. Love for worship, but we must love the church and worship God his way and not our way. We must approach him the way he directs and not the way we think we should. He says in verse 5, he says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. I love that verse because you see every single one of us in one form or another are on a pilgrimage. We're on a journey. We're on a spiritual birth line. For some of you, you have not yet been converted. But God has all along been speaking to your heart. 
He's been birthing ideas in you. He's been revealing himself piece by piece so that you will understand it is by faith that we come to Christ. And some of you are along that spiritual birth line. You've heard the gospel. You've heard the word of God, but you have not yet been converted. You're on a journey. You're on a pilgrimage. Some of us as believers, all of us as believers, in one shape, way, shape, or form, are on a spiritual journey. All of us are on a pilgrimage. He says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. What he means by that is blessed are those who are over here alienated from you and see where they need to be and who are making the journey to get there. Blessed are those who do not have that intimacy with you, where there is something blocking that intimacy, who are here and long to be here, and they're on that journey to get there. Thank you for listening. For the complete sermon, please visit markinc.org and click In His Grip. Join Dr. Chuck F. Betters in the sanctuary from Monday to Friday on the In His Grip podcast.